All right, today our presenter is Eva Buckner. Um, she is um, at uh, Medical Entomology Extension Specialist at the Florida Medical Entomology Laboratory in Vero Beach. So we're so thrilled that she's here. She's responsible for consultation and training on medically important arthropods, mosquito-borne diseases like dengue, chikungunya, West Nile, and Zika. Um, she tests the efficacy of mosquito control products and insecticide resistance testing and management. She's been with IFAS for about four years now. So she started um, just a little bit before the pandemic. And so we're glad to see your face. Um, and today she's going to talk to us about mosquitoes and their control in Florida and about IMM, Integrated Mosquito Management. So Eva, uh, Eva, we welcome you and we're so glad you're here. I'm going to stop sharing and you can go ahead and share your screen now. Thank you. And thank you so much for that awesome introduction. <laughs> you made it so that I don't have to uh, do much to introduce myself. So thank you for that. <laughs> All right, so just quickly, I want to make sure that you're seeing only the screen uh, with my title slide. Okay. We are, but we're, we are, but, but we also see your face up at the top too, which is good. Okay, fantastic. Perfect. <laughs> <Okay>. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Um, so yes, um, like uh, when you said I've been um, an assistant professor and uh, the medical entomology state extension specialist um, with the University of Florida um, for four years. Um, and so I work with the public um, uh, and mosquito control programs and um, other um, public health professionals um, providing extension is uh, really the, the um, main the bulk of my appointment. So I'm really thankful for this opportunity um, to be here today. So thank you so much. So I'm just gonna go ahead and dive in um, and talk about just some little bit of background information on mosquitoes and um, their life cycle. Probably this crowd already knows this information. I feel like this is a, a knowledgeable crowd. So um, forgive me if you've already know all this, um, but I think it's you know helpful in kind of putting things in perspective um, with you know why certain treatments are effective, why certain things are done um, at certain times. So just um, this, here I'm just starting off with. Um, the first slide on the mosquito life cycle. And um, there's four stages within uh, the mosquito life cycle. So they have a complex life cycle. And so the first stage is gonna be the egg stage. And um, due to there being diversity within mosquitoes, you know, the, the way that the egg um, is, uh, looks can be different. So it can be, uh, and the way it's laid can be different. So it can be laid singly or it can be laid, um, multiple eggs can be laid together in a raft. And so that's what those two um, pictures are just trying to show that um, there's, you know, differences in how they can be laid, but um, that's, you know, the first stage would be the egg stage. Then next stage is a larva stage. So that's gonna be um, the, aquatic um, stage and um, the aquatic feeding stage and um, it goes the larva goes through four um, successively larger instars um, during that stage and so this is um, the stage where it's going to be um, swimming um, and also able to eat and then the, the third stage is going to be the pupa stage and this is stage is also going to be aquatic um, and it's going to not, it's going to be active, but it's going to be the non-feeding stage. And that's going to be the stage where the, um, adult characteristics are forming. Um, and then, uh, finally we have our adult life stage. And so that's going to be the terrestrial stage that I feel like most of us are most, um, familiar with and that, um, you know, can cause annoyance. And so um, the 
adult will emerge from the pupil skins um, once they're complete, once they complete development. And, um, you know, there, this image is just showing the differences between uh, what male and female mosquitoes look like. Um, in, in general, um, adult mosquitoes are going to live about two to four weeks depending on the species and of course, environmental conditions like humidity and temperature. Um, and then females are generally gonna live longer than males. So now that you have a little bit of that background information, let's talk more about actual mosquitoes um, in uh, Florida and actually let's just, do, I want to do a quick mention of um, that there is over 3,500 mosquito species worldwide. Um, and so there is really a lot of mosquito species out there. And uh, in, in the state of Florida, you know, it's, it's certainly a hot spot for mosquitoes as well as uh, I think a lot of other animals. <laughs> um, and that really has to do with the fact specifically for mosquitoes is because that um, they cannot maintain an internal core temperature. Um, and so really uh, the fact that Florida offers, you know, a different areas, either tropical or subtropical climate, um, it's really, um, great conditions. Um, and due to the fact that there is diversity of aquatic habitats, this really allows for um, multiple, so many species to be able to find that right place or that right habitat for them. And so when we generally talk about the different aquatic habitats that we find mosquitoes in, um, the aquatic phases. Um, so we usually talk about the floodwater permanent and container habitats. And I have just, you know, a cup, a picture each to represent the different habitats. And so a floodwater habitat is going to be one that can change quickly um, depending on the weather conditions. Um, and then once the habitats are inundated with water, um, the eggs are going to hatch. And this type of habitat um, is going to be represented by, so um, marshes, like what's on the slide, mudflats, um, low-lying pastures, fields, and other cit citrus bureaus and ditches. And then we also have uh, mosquitoes that you can find in what, um, in permanent water habitats. And so these are going to be the habitats that re remain wet most of the time. So like ponds, swamps, and brackish marshes. And then the last habitat that we usually classify uh, mosquitoes into um, being based on their aquatic habitat is going to be container habitats or container mosquitoes. And when I talk about that, I'm talking about um, small water-filled natural or man-made containers. Um, so when talking about natural, examples are going to be tree holes, bromeliads. Um, also uh, for the man-made containers, it's going to be bottles, tires, buckets, um, and other items like that. So things that you might, be, might find in your backyard that could potentially fill with water. So based on this abundance of um, aquatic habitats, it allows for there to um, us to be home to approximately 90 species of mosquitoes. Um, so, and there is a lot of diversity within those mosquito species. And I really love this photo on the bottom of the slide um, that my colleague, Larry Reeves, provided um, because it, it just, I think it does a great job of really showing the type of diversity that's present within mosquito species that you can even find here in the state of Florida. So on the right hand side is the um, Pachyrinchides rutilus and so common name being the elephant mosquito. It's our largest species in the state. 
Um, and then on the left-hand side is um, Aedes albopictus, uh, the Asian tiger mosquito, and it's a medium-sized mosquito. Um, so um, I do quickly want to address that there are a lot of non-native species of mosquitoes that have um, recently made it into Florida. Um, there's at least 17 and, you know, they certainly have the possibility um, of becoming invasive species. Um, and then we do have uh, four invasive species um, present here. And um, there's always the possibility of, of more um, species, not more non-native species being introduced into the state, just because um, we are connected to many international areas where there are other species present that could be brought here. And then due to um, our climate that is so great for mosquitoes, hot and warm, sorry, <laughs> warm and humid is what I was trying to say. Um, So I also want to give you some background information on the feeding preferences of adult mosquitoes. Um, just again, this is probably all just information you know, but just as a reminder, it's only going to be the um, out of the mosquito species that um, do blood feed. Um, it's only going to be the female mosquitoes that do take blood meals. Um, so all male mosquitoes, regardless of the species, um, they're only going to feed on nectar. And then additionally, there are some mosquito species um, that the females don't actually feed on blood at all. Um, and so and in that case, they're just going to feed on nectar. Um, and one example of that is our largest mosquito species in the state, Toxorhynchides rutilus, the elephant mosquito. And a super cool thing about Toxorhynchides is that it's actually a predator in its larval stage and it eats other smaller mosquito species um, in, in the aquatic stage. And so because it's eating um, all these other mosquito larvae, it's able to acquire enough protein during that larval stage that it doesn't actually need to blood feed in that adult stage to get the protein that's needed to finish developing eggs in the adult stage, which is the reason that um, other species are going to be blood feeding. It's the females need for um, getting protein to finish developing eggs. Um, and it and actually it's going to be the majority of species that do fall into that class um, where the females are going to be um, feeding on both blood and nectar. The blood, like I said, is going to be a protein source and the nectar is going to be a carbohydrate source. Um, and so like there, as this slide is pointed out, you know, like there's differences in the feeding preferences of mosquitoes. And then there's also um, differences in the time of day when these mosquitoes um, might be blood feeding or you know, seeking out nectar. So there can be species that are gonna be most active during the daytime or most active at dawn and dusk or um, at, just at night. Um, additionally, there can be variation. Um, you know, the different species um, might feed on different hosts. So um, recently, um, it was discovered that that mosquitoes don't always just blood feed on vertebrates. And we recently discovered that sometimes they actually um, take blood meals from inverte invertebrates. So Uranitania saccharina is one um, species that was discovered that it actually takes, um, I guess you can't really call it blood meals, but it takes meals from um, earthworms. So that's really interesting. Uh, and then for those um, female mosquitoes that do take blood meals from vertebrates, they're either going, they can you know, feed on a, a variety of different 
vertebrate classes. So they may have preferences for feeding on um, reptiles, birds, or mammals, or any of the above. And then, you know, within those groups, um, there are species that um, specifically focus on feeding on humans, um, primarily going to be um, Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito, and um, the Asian tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus, um, our domestic, two of our domestic mosquito species. So it's during that process of when um, a mosquito is taking a, a bite from um, its host that it can actually become infected with pathogens like viruses. Um, and I do wanna point out that it's not all mosquito species that are capable of transmitting pathogens like viruses um, in the state of Florida. We only have about, uh, we actually have less than 10 species that are gonna be um, um, competent vectors of viruses. Um, and then of course, we also, like I said, we, we do have some that will blood feed. Um, they don't, they aren't able to transmit viruses. Um, and so sometimes they're just gonna be nuisances. Um, but for our mosquito species that are able to transmit viruses, I just wanted to briefly go over um, show you a diagram of how that works, how mosquitoes do get infected, um, and then how they become vectors of pathogens. In this case, talking about you know virus, um, what's going to happen is that you know mosquito is going to feed on a host um, that has virus infected blood, and then the infected blood is going to travel to the mid gut, so like the belly of the mosquito. Um, and then the virus is able to escape out of the belly. It travels up through the circulatory system of the mosquito and makes its way to the salivary glands of the mosquito and it infects the salivary glands. So then every time that that mosquito takes a blood meal from its ho another host, as it takes a blood meal, it's always going to try put in some saliva. Um, to try and, you know, keep the wound open and to be able to blood feed, um, make that process easier. And so during that process is when the virus infected saliva can be um, injected into um, an uninfected host, getting that host infected. So that's really, that's the process. Um, generally mosquitoes are when they get infected by viruses, it certainly can vary, but in general, they are themselves not gonna have negative impacts. So they're just considered a vector. So I did just wanna briefly give you an update on, you know, this mosquito-borne diseases in Florida. We do have two different categories of mosquito-borne diseases. Um, we have what are known as our exotic mosquito-borne diseases. Um, what I mean by that is um, they're gonna be, uh, our mosquito-borne diseases, um, they're not established and they're unlikely to persist, persist once a human outbreak ends. So the and examples of these are going to be uh, dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. So they're not established here in the continental United States. We can get transmission of, the, of those viruses in the state of Florida because we do have mosquito species, uh, the mosquito species, um, Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito that can um, transmit those viruses, but it's going to take a person that got infected outside of the continental United States coming into the US and getting fed on by one of our local mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti, to start an outbreak here um, within Florida. And then, like I said, once that outbreak ends, it's gonna take another person coming that's infected outside the US, um, coming in, bringing that infection within Florida to start another outbreak or, um, 
or even just another case. So that's how that transmission cycle, that transmission cycle is going to work for exotics. Um, so for the exotic mos mosquito-borne virus diseases, um, for Zika, we haven't had any local transmission since um, 2017. For chikungunya, um, we haven't had local transmission since 2014. Um, but our, our major exotic mosquito-borne disease that we have human cases for of, in Florida is going to be dengue. Um, and so generally, our dengue cases are going to be concentrated in South Florida, um, usually actually Southeast Florida, in the Miami Dade County areas, um, and to the counties north and south of there, because there's a lot of, um, there's just so much travel back and forth um, from Miami um, or to Miami from areas that do have local um, or endemic dengue transmission, that there's always going to be people that are infected outside the U.S. There just seems to be like there's always there's people from the outside the U.S. that are coming in and have the potential for starting um, um, local transmission within Florida. So there are 49 cases in uh 2022 and 71 in 2020. Um, there were not any cases documented in uh, 2021. So that's why I didn't list any there. So for our endemic viruses, they operate uh, differently. They are gonna be considered established. And so there's gonna be year round transmission of these viruses within our state. But unlike exotic, um, our, unlike our exotic viruses we just talked about, um, for our endemic viruses, mosquito-borne viruses, humans are not really the ideal host for those viruses. Really the transmission cycle, um, the primary transmission cycle for the endemic viruses that we have in Florida, it's gonna be um, actually bird a bird mosquito bird transmission cycle. That's what these um, St. Louis encephalitis virus, Eastern equine encephalitis virus, um, West Nile virus, they're generally going to be, um, the primary host of the virus are going to be birds. And then um, it's gonna be mosquitoes that are um, transmitting that virus between birds. Um, so humans are actually considered dead in host um, within that, the endemic um, mosquito-borne disease transmission cycles, uh, because um, when we get infected with one of these viruses, we never get enough virus titer within us that if a mosquito were to take a blood meal from us, it's not going to get infected. So, from the virus point of view, it's considered a dead end host because anybody, any other mosquito that feeds on it, uh, an infected human isn't going to pick that virus up. Um, and so, what happened, the reason that we end up getting infected sometimes um, is because um, when I talked about the um, host feeding preferences of mosquitoes, there are some that are going to, like I said, just prefer to like feed just on birds, but then there's some that are going to be opportunistic. They're going to prefer to eat on, take blood meals from birds, but if they can't, you know, um, find a bird and they come across a human, they may opportunistically take a blood meal from a human. And should they have been infected already from, you know, taking a blood meal from an inf infected bird previously, um, and then they take a blood meal from a human, that's how that human is going to get infected. So generally, um, we are going to see less um, cases of our, our endemic um, viruses compared to our exotic viruses when we have outbreaks. Um, but one thing to point out, um, 
and even when we don't have outbreaks, you know, we do generally have less of these cases. But one thing to point out is that the symptoms from the um, endemic viruses can sometimes be more severe when compared to our exotic viruses. And so um, there can be less cases, but of those cases, there could potentially be um, more um, more severe symptoms. So certainly, you know, all mosquito-borne diseases are, you know, very important and um, should be um, considered. Um, so just quickly talking about um, what we have seen with recent past in terms of our endemic viruses. Um, we haven't seen any St. Louis encephalitis virus human cases since 2014. There haven't um, the last um, Eastern equine encephalitis virus human cases we saw were in, were in 2018. Um, so West Nile is definitely going to be our um, most common um, mosquito endemic mosquito-borne virus um, that we see causing cases in humans. Um, so we had um, of just five cases in 2022. Um, there were no cases documented in 2021, but there was an outbreak um, in 2020 and we had 50 human cases in 2020. So now kind of shifting from background information on mosquitoes, their biology, ecology, and their role within the transmission cycle of um, diseases, I, I now want to talk about mosquito control. Um, and I think it, it's important to address the question of, you know, why should mosquito control um, take place? And, and really, there's two large reasons. Um, so um, for the, you know, protecting public health. So, um, for preventing or reducing human and animal cases of the mosquito-borne diseases that um, I just talked about. Um, certainly that's very important. Another reason is going to be um, trying to reduce the populations of our nuisance mosquitoes that we have in Florida. Um, certainly, you know, Florida is uh, has a large um, tourism has a lot of tourism. And um, I think maybe for the natives might be uh, more used to dealing with some of the annoying effects of mosquitoes, but certainly I, um, high levels of nuisance mosquitoes can have a negative impact on, on tourism. Additionally, after natural disasters like hurricanes or um, um, tropical storms, there can be flooding. And when there's flooding, what will happen is uh, mosquito eggs that have built up uh, in the soil, um, that flooding is going to um, reach areas that have not gotten wet recently. And so it's going to lead to eggs that were in the soil um, getting wet. And so it's going to lead to these large numbers of mosquitoes hatching. Um, after, like I said, hurricanes and um, um, tropical storms. And so just the nuisance that's caused, especially when people are trying to clean up in the aftermath of events like that, you know, um, mosquito control is, is certainly um, important in times like that. Uh, and then of course, just try, trying to live normal lives, have nighttime activities, outdoor summer activities. Um, mosquito control is certainly um, important to allow uh, people to enjoy um, this wonderful state. So we do have, so due to the presence uh, and the need to control mosquito, uh, mosquitoes within the state, we, Florida is actually one of the few states within the U.S. with extensive um, organized mosquito control programs. And so within the state of Florida, um, this was, um, this estimate was from uh, 2021. So there might actually be one new program, but um, there is um, 66 
state approved um, mosquito control programs in Florida. And so um, because mosquito control pro programs are licensed pest um, pesticide applicators, they are regulated by the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. So when I say state approved, I'm referring to FDAX. Um, and so um, it's gonna be FDAX that's responsible for um, regulating our you know, uh, local mosquito control programs. And I do just wanna show that, um, and that's what this slide is, is showing, um, it's, images from a, a recent survey that went out to mos mosquito control programs. Um, they do, the majority do utilize um, integrated mosquito management for um, controlling mosquitoes. So um, using surveillance, um, multiple approaches to control mosquitoes. And then um, within the tools that they use for controlling mosquitoes, those survey respondents um, said that they, the most common approaches to controlling mosquitoes that they used were the truck mounted um, ultra low volume adulticiding, so space spraying I'm going to talk about in more um, detail in just a minute, and then also using um, bio paste, sorry, biopesticide based larviciding. So um, using things like the bacterial um, metabolite, um, so and then using biopesticides. That's going to be um, the types of um, you know what the the different tools that the programs indicated um, using um, the most within integrated mosquito management plans. And then um, I just wanted to quickly show this map that I got from, um, I took from FDAX's website. It just shows um, the locations of the, um, the central you know, um, operating site of um, the mosquito control programs that are state approved within the state. Um, and what I do wanna just quickly say is, um, even though it's not, it may not be um, clear from this map, I do wanna just say that certainly there is going to be variation within the, how mosquito control programs are operated within the state. And a lot of the reason there is um, variation in the, in the way programs do different things, unfortunately, it's gonna be based on, on financial reasons. Um, and so within our state, we have programs that range in their annual budget from approximately $9,000 to over $30 million. So you, you kind of, you know, those programs that are really re receiving the majority of their funding from FDAX, you know, they're going to have less ability to seek out additional, maybe um, next generational tools for mosquito control compared to maybe a program that um, does have such a large budget. And just, just to be aware, um, a lot of the reasons for where mosquito control programs got started in our state and where like the ones with the larger budgets are. Um, it's really in those areas of um, South Florida that, you know, are going to deal with um, salt marsh mosquitoes that are just such a huge nuisance. Um, and then, um, you know, areas in Southern Florida, they're going to have um, the potential of having mosquitoes year round. Whereas in Northern Florida and in the panhandle, mosquito season is, is you know, it really is more, uh, it is more seasonal. And so the, generally the budgets of the programs, since they're not year round within the panhandle and also in North Florida, they're generally going to be lower than um, the budgets in the, within the programs that are in, 
Southern Florida. So I just kind of wanted to give you an idea that um, really the size of the program can be influenced by the location of it within the state. And I also just kind of now want to talk more about the different mosquito control methods that are used by programs, just to kind of give you um, a look behind the curtains um, at mosquito control operations um, that may potentially allow you to know more about um, what's happening, what these mosquito control programs are doing. So <clears throat> I so it, all of the pro um, the different agencies that provide recommendations to uh, mosquito control programs um, and uh, regulations um, regulate the program. They all are going to recommend using integrated uh, pest management for mosquito control and so integrated mosquito management. And I just wanted to quickly go over that definition because I'm gonna say it a lot <laughs> for the duration of this presentation, um, but it's gonna be comprehensive surveillance and science-based mosquito prevention and control strategy that's gonna utilize all available control methods against um, multiple mosquito life stages. It's gonna be environmentally friendly, saves money, and is effective. Um, this slide is just listing the different components within an integrated mosquito management plan. Certainly not every program is going to utilize all these different, um, they may not utilize all these different components um, to control mosquitoes. Um, and, but certainly at least most programs are gonna use some type of combination. And so, um, I'm gonna talk about the different components um, more in detail, um, but they consist of surveillance, uh, physical control, um, so mosquito habitat manipulation, um, mosquito management, so source reduction, biological control, the precise use of insecticides um, and community engagement, and then insecticide efficacy and resistance monitoring. So I do want to point out that a, you know, a mosquito control program should be in the majority of the ones that, you know, the ones that I interact with um, and try to improve the capacity of, they're going to be um, using um, science uh, to determine their actions. And so they're going to be using surveillance to um, determine the problem and then determine um, the thresholds at which they are gonna to need to respond. And then also um, the correct treatment to be used and as well as determining the efficacy of their treatment methods. And so while, you know, I, I just like to point out that yes, surveillance is a important part of um, mosquito control programs and um, them applying their treatments. So talking not just about surveillance of mosquitoes, about one third of our mosquito con pro control programs in our states um, use sentinel chickens to um, sur conduct surveillance of our endemic arboviruses. Um, and the reason that sentinel chickens are used is because um, they are, they don't themselves get sick from the virus, um, but they do produce antibodies to the virus because they're birds. Um, they're going to be, you know, part of that transmission cycle um, for our endemic arboviruses. And, um, but cool thing about them, like I said, they're not going to get sick. Um, they're not going to pass on the um, virus to their eggs, and also their virus level within them never gets high enough um, to allow an uninfected mosquito to feed on them and then pick up the virus. So they really are um, a fantastic signal animal for monitoring um, the 
if there's tr transmission of these endemic viruses in an area. And so the way this is done is that there are sentinel chickens usually in these cages, you can see pictured in the bottom, um, placed throughout um, the jurisdiction of a program. Um, weekly, there's blood samples taken from every chicken, and then um, they're sent to the Florida Department of Health and tested for antibodies. And so um, they look for those antibodies, and the goal of that is to hopefully detect antibodies to our endemic um, viruses in the chickens or in the, the bird mosquito um, transmission cycle before possibly we have some overflow to humans um, to have that opportunity to um, conduct treatment in that area, hopefully before a human illness occurs. So that's the goal of Sentinel chickens um, and how they're used as part of surveillance within mosquito control. Um, biological control is also an important part of mosquito control. Um, generally, it's going to be the aquatic stage where this is going to be most successful, um, utilizing mosquito fish to eat the mosquito larvae. I also do want to point out that using insecticides, it's always going to be a vital part of any insect um, integrated mosquito management plan. Um, but it's important to remember that insecticides can be natural. And so, like I said, talked about the bacterial metabolites, um, they're not all just gonna be um, completely chemical based. Um, so, you know, just something to keep in mind. So whenever a, a program is gonna be thinking about you know, what insecticide to use, there's different considerations, um, different things they consider, you know, about which um, insecticide to use. And so I just wanted to cover quickly some of those. Certainly, it has to be registered for use both in the US and Florida. Um, also, one consideration is going to be at what life stage is the are the mosquitoes that are trying to be targeted with that insecticide? Um, if they're larvae, then uh, a larvicide is going to be more appropriate. If they're adults, an adulticide is going to be more appropriate. The usually um, the way that mosquito control works is um, you want to try to first reduce the mosquito habitat um, and then next use a larvicide to reduce the larvae. And then if those methods don't work, next go to an adulticide. So um, it's always easier to treat and be effective at killing larvae compared to adults because larvae are gonna be contained within a water body as compared to adults that are gonna be flying around. Um, and also generally, Larvae, so larvicides are going to be more specific um, and have the possibility of less non target effects um, than adulticides. Timing is also something that's going to be considered. You only want to make the tr mosquito controlled treatments um, if you're trying to treat for adults when those mosquitoes are active, active and flying around and they may come in contact with the. Um, adult aside that's in the air. Um, also um, timing um, related to uh, non-targets, their activity. Um, generally, mosquito controlled treatments are gonna made, uh, be made at night um, to try and uh, reduce the impact on the honeybee. So when they're usually going to be in their hives, weather is also something to consider. Um, Applications of adulticides cannot be made when um, the winds are greater than 10 miles per hour. So um, if that's the case, then a treatment can't be made. Um, and then efficacy against local mosquitoes should also be considered by these programs. And because um, if you always wanna use product that's effective because you can use less and it'll be more cost-effective. 
So these next few slides, I'm just gonna show the different ways that um, larvicides and adulticide applications can be made. So generally, if um, a site is being treated, if the larvae within a site are being treated um, and it's, you know, these sites are gonna be smaller, um, they're going to be treated usually um, by hand using like a backpack sprayer or um, by truck. So just, this is just to give you an idea of when and um, what type of tools are gonna be used to make those type of um, applications. So if um, a site where the um, larvae are that are, you know, are wanting, the program's wanting to treat, that's when they're going to use um, something like, uh, you know, using an focus on aerial application. So this could be using an airplane helicopter or UAV. Um, and usually those, the larvicide applications are gonna be conducted during the day. Um, so I talked about insecticide use consideration in general. One thing to be aware of is that for um, a, using adulticides, there's even additional considerations that have to be made by these programs by law. They have to meet um, these thresholds to be able to make adulticide applications. Uh, and you know these are listed here and they actually have to provide records, keep records of these when they make treatments and what data they use to make these treatments or to base their decision to make these treatments on. And they have to actually provide that data to FDACs. So um, using adulticides, um, like I said, usually adulticides are gonna be used generally after trying to use source reduction and larviciding. Um, the primary method of adulticiding is going to be uh, using use of a space spray to drift through a target area. Um, generally, chemical concentrates are gonna be used or they're going to be, this is generally how it's used, done in state of Florida. They're actually going to be diluted with um, some type of, um, usually some type of close, something like mineral oil. And this, and so what happens is the actual amount of the active ingredient that's actually being used is very low. Um, and so it's actually, when you see a lot of that spray that's coming out um, during a space spray application, what you're really seeing is the majority of it is going to be a diluent, um, usually a diluent oil, or if it's a water-based product, going to be water. And so really, um, the amount of active, active ingredient that's usually applied um, per the area of the size of a football field is really about um, an ounce. Um, and so what's going to happen with these products, they're going to remain in the air column. Um, and it's going to, the mosquitoes are actually gonna have to come in contact with those drops um, to actually have the, um, any effect of those um, um, experience the mortality effects of those, um, the adulticide. And so certainly um, there's different um, methods that are gonna be used for applying adulticides. And it's really like a larvicide that's gonna be based on um, really the size of the treatment area. Um, you know, small areas are gonna use um, smaller application methods and then go out to larger application methods to even, the, you know, using um, a helicopter to make um, an application. And certainly, you know, using an adulticide during an active outbreak of a mosquito-borne disease is very important. Um, so that's why, you know, yes, you always wanna try and use source reduction and larviciding before you, re you resort to adulticiding, but it is an important tool, especially during an outbreak to potentially reduce human cases of mosquito-borne diseases. And while larviciding is generally gonna be conducted um, during the day, 
usually adult deciding is going to be conducted at night, um, generally uh, because there's going to be less people out and also um, in an attempt to have less of effect on uh, non-targets. Sure. Ava, or Eva, we are right at seven minutes to two and we have lots of questions. So okay. I'm going to go ahead and stop you. All right. Um, and I'm going to ask some burning questions. Okay. Um, and I'm going to ask that you be succinct in your answers. Super. Um, how uh, people are wondering how long are those eggs uh, viable? I know it depends, but on general, um, how basically how long are those eggs going to be, um, you know, viable in the environment? Depends on the species. They can be good for a couple of weeks up to um, even a couple of years. <laughs> how many? A couple of years. Oh, gosh. OK, everybody, a couple of years. <laughs> Um, but generally, then, our floodwater species aren't going to be our um, vectors. Um, and then people are worrying about the, um, you know, the collateral damage of bees and uh, Lepidoptera species uh, from the from the spraying and control. And how do you all try to mitigate that? So um, hopefully, I, I did already cover some of that. Um, it's always programs and what we teach to, you know, what I teach to programs um, is to use um, source reduction. So getting rid of the mosquito habitat first, then larviciding, because it is going to have uh, less non-target effects and only result resort to adulticiding if necessary. And um, because, and so there's, there's a sequence of events that's followed to try and reduce um, negative impacts, as well as the timing of when um, the applications are made. Um, so generally, adulticides are which have are going to be less specific um, and potentially have more non-target effects are going to be utilized at night when there is going to be less non-targets active. Sure, sure. Um, someone's wondering about citronella candles working. They're not. So I only recommend products that are um, the CDC recommends and the EPA recommends because I care about them being effective um, in against um, mosquito borne diseases. And so, no, that's not something that I recommend. So um, I recommend only the um, repellents, active ingredients that are recommended by the CDC. Um, and you can certainly go to the CDC's website and find the list of these. Okay. Um, someone was wondering, do the viruses that you described earlier actually multiply in the mosquitoes? Do, yes. do those, they do, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that there were 17 non-native species. Why are only four invasive? Uh, because it, to become an invasive species, you have to be not just non-native, but also have a negative impact on either the economy or, in the case of mosquitoes, public health. So it's a, it's a, um, there's a difference in the um, definition of those two words. And so um, I, we only consider invasive species those that um, are non-native and have negative. Um, impact either on native species or um, have negative impact on public health. Okay. So there's only um, four of those. Okay. That's interesting. Um, what about the Skeeter Vax? Do they provide any control? So it's going to be very limited <laughs> and, you know, very, you know, just around you, you could certainly try and utilize them. Yeah. But again, it's going to be like very limited. Um, it certainly wouldn't be something that I recommend using as only um, one way of con trying to um, control mosquitoes around you. Okay. Um, and what about the um, uh, using the GMO um, technology to make males sterile? Are you all going down that path? So, um, so that is happening only in the Florida Keys, um, but with um, Florida Keys Mosquito Control District and OxyTech, um, that's only taking place there. Um, and we do have a grant application. University of Florida does have, and specifically me and some of my colleagues, we do have a grant application and to try and evaluate the, um, you know, an objective nonpartisan evaluator um, to see if that method um, affects the genetics of 
of mosquitoes. So um, I certainly, uh, I mean, I don't like actively participate in that, no, but I certainly have um, produced uh, materials to try and educate the public more about that. And those documents can be found um, through um, on Ask IFAS. Okay, there's a lot of great documents. So the other two burning questions are about um, bird baths uh, and bromeliads, the two Bs, bird baths and bromeliads. So, um, so the best way to try and help mosquito control and reduce the use of adulticides um, was to work with mosquito control, not against them. And because a lot of the nuisance and vectors um, that we have are actually ones that we cause problems of ourselves. Um, so they're gonna be ones that um, use our um, container habitats in our backyards. And so hopefully you can see this slide. This is what you can do to reduce mosquitoes in your backyards. So um, for those containers that you can dump, um, dump them out at least once a week for um, the um, containers that can't be dumped like bird baths, you want to either use a you know high pressure water hose to clean them out, or use um, mosquito bits, or um, and that's going to be a BTI based product. Put it in there, or um, and so that can be done both for the uh, man made containers and also the um, native um, natural containers like bromeliads. And then of course some mosquito control programs do provide um, mosquito fish for, um, uh, local backyards. Right. Um, and someone wanted to add a third, uh, third B of bat houses. Are you all seeing any control with that or is just. <clears throat> so what I will tell you is that bats are always going to prefer to eat a nice juicy moth in comparison to a mosquito. Uh, mosquitoes are only gonna be eaten um, basically on the way to um, bats going to a better um, meal. So um, I do not recommend bat houses as a mosquito control um, tool. Great, good. Um, I think, um, did you wanna mention the new species that was discovered and we'll go ahead and close with that. Um, there was just, <laughs> Like I said, because Florida is um, such a great place for mosquitoes, we do um, often have non-natives being introduced. Um, one non-native that's been identified recently is just a mosquito species called Culex lactator. It's been um, found within our some of our Southern Florida counties. So Miami-Dade um, and Collier, Lee um, and, really about that species, um, it's, we're gonna have to monitor it and see if it's going to be spreading and also what impact it's gonna have um, potentially. We don't even know if it's going to have impact on any of our um, transmission of our um, endemic viruses. So we're, mosquito control programs are certainly, as well as researchers gonna be um, actively monitoring that species. Very good. Um, it yeah, Eva, is the slide about the what people can put on their own body, um, is that um, in some of your, um, yes, that one, is that in some of your publication material as well? Yes, that's actually um, pulled from the, um, there's a extension document called Mosquitoes and Repellents, oh. and some of the, those figures are actually pulled from that document. So I highly recommend um, you know, you know, checking out a lot of those um, documents that are available through um, Ask IFIS. They, and um, please, if there's other things you have questions about, feel free to email me. Right, and I want to people to know that you are our resource. Um, if people yeah. need you to come to regional trainings or county trainings or do a Zoom, um, especially in and around the uh, Vero Beach, uh, that they should have you come in and maybe even get even more in depth. And would you, would you bring some larva with you and some, you yeah. know, things like that? I think that um, you have so much to offer and your and your and the facility there is doing such amazing work. And I know that you could share about that too. So this was just like to an appetizer to get ready for all the um, great materials that you're going to have in the future too. Yes. I would love to participate more. So please let me know if um, you guys would like me to. 
Fantastic. All right. We'll see you next time, Eva. Thank you so much. Everybody do your survey. Okay. She needs those numbers. She's a, she needs to get, um, you know, not worldwide. So we need those numbers. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.